Okay, hello everybody here. And um, hello also uh, all the thirds that are watching us uh, on the live streams and all the people at home that cannot come here. Um, we are four, four people who have done a fun project. And um, my name is Felix. Um, there's Tillman, Georg and Mark. And, um, we would like to show you the results of our fun project, which is um, taking over the storm board net. Okay, so um, there are some critical things about the laws, you know. So we can't really show you here um, how to take over the whole board net. We would uh, even get in trouble if taking over one single machine if it's not our own. So we can only demonstrate this with our own machine, but we can assure you this, was, this is really working in the real storm board net. <laughs> Right, there are still um, too many people here, probably Leos as well. Any law enforcement officers here? <laughs> no. Okay, and um, we will also publish our source code, but we cannot publish the full source code, like to have a ready-made tool, but we can only uh, publish parts which are for research and stuff, you know, research. And, uh, <laughs> right. Um, Okay, um, and because we have done the work all together, we have also split the talk. And um, Georg is starting with a so short introduction, and then every one of us is giving um, some details about a specific part and how we all did it. All right? So have fun. Um, ah, great. So, hi everybody. I'll be starting with a very brief and uh, high-level introduction to the Stormworm botnet. Actually, Stormworm is the most known name, but there's a lot of different names for this malware family. So there's PCOM and, and I don't know how to pronounce the others in, in English, but there's a lot of names, as you can see on the slides. And this thread was actually first seen somewhere in summer 2006, so this is not so new. Um, back then, in 2007, the estimated size was 500,000 to 1 million infected computers, which is actually, in botnet terms, not so, so huge. So there's other big botnets that are still ISC-based. But this one was new, and actually, the 1 million host estimate was, yeah, it was very high. So people think it was lower, but this was the estimate back then. And right now, according to our estimations, the actual botnet size is below 100,000. That is, that is the botnet uh, bots that we saw. So maybe we don't see everything, but that's what we estimated. So it shrank. And that is because uh, back in 2007, Microsoft used their, well, authority to all Windows XP computers with the update uh, mechanism and the malicious software removal tool to remove 250,000 infections they counted. So um, this is why the botnet shrank a lot, and also this means there was at some point at least 250,000 for sure because Microsoft counted it like this. So what does it do? I mean, uh, there's again a technically interested person running this botnet. Um, some people in, at first thought it was the Russians running the botnet. Nowadays people say, well, they're using servers in Russia, but it might be actually Americans because, uh, as we'll later see, it looks like they're real American uh, cultured people. So what does it do? Well, it sends spam for profit and also for spreading. It performs distributed denial of service attacks because um, either for blackmailing, but we didn't see that actually, but the, the, what we saw is if, you, if you're a researcher, and uh, they think uh, you're wanting to reverse engineer them because, for example, you download a binary very, very often from the same IP address, um, you will just get a DDoS on yourself. So they're actually trying to protect their, their network. And then what they're doing is, of course, harvest email addresses because the selves you're sending spam. So how do you actually get this uh, stuff on, on your whatever that is? Um, yeah. Infection vectors, sample spammed as mail attachments. This is not very sophisticated per se. So you have uh, Mr. Santa Claus. This was uh, 2007, um, before, just before Christmas. So uh, they say, oh, download the free scripture of this nice Santa Claus girl. Halloween uh, 2007, there was a dancing skeleton. So uh, if, you, if you click on this, uh, you will have a funny dancing skeleton on your desktop. Hey, do this. Uh, then someone. Uh, uh, this or last year, there was also invasion of Iran. So they sent, oh, new news, USA invaded the Iran, and here's the video. Download this exit to show the video. 
So, but they are a little bit more sophisticated than just trusting on the average dump user. Actually, they are linking to web pages that have drive-by exploits. So you click on the, on the link uh, in the email, and then you're redirected to a page that has some exploits for Internet Explorer and stuff like this. And only if they determine that you're not vulnerable to all these exploits, they send you a raw link to the simple binary. So this is how you get Storm. If you're, you probably, the guys here didn't click on the dancing skeleton, maybe you clicked on the stripping Santa. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's more for, for, the, for the average PC user that gets infected by this. Once you're infected, how does it work and what's new about it? Actually, Stormworm botnet is not a classical, traditional IRC-like botnet or whatever. It's a peer-to-peer -peer botnet. So this means you cannot just go to Russia or wherever, or China, and take down their command and control server and say, bam, your botnet is gone. This is what law enforcement is doing all the time with other botnets. But this one actually uses a peer-to-peer -peer network for communication, and you can hardly take down all 250,000 or more storm warm nodes per hand and say, now the botnet is gone. <laughs> yeah, Schäuble could, of course. Um, but um, what it actually does is that it uses this peer-to-peer -peer network for finding the real command and control servers. So it's not really that a command and control that is only in the peer-to-peer -peer network where commands are forwarded or stuff like this. Uh, it just uses this peer-to-peer -peer network as a kind of replacement for DNS. So um, once a storm worm tries to find new commands, what it first does is um, it goes to the peer-to-peer -peer network, it bootstraps, we'll see more about this later on, and uh, asks, where can I find a command and control server which, which gives me these commands? And then, as you can see here, it's somewhere, it, it routes a query through the network based on a specific hash, and then some node knows, oh, the command and control server is over here, and then it initiates a second command and control connection that is TCP based actually to, to a uh, node that can tell him these are the updates. So the actual commands are not sent via the peer to peer network, but they are sent via a custom TCP protocol that contains certain command strings and how to behave. So it's, it's not fully peer to peer, it's not so super sophisticated. As we see, they actually reused, uh, uh, reused a library that will be explained later on for, for the peer-to-peer -peer stuff. So what they did, they took their existing stuff and just replaced DNS by this peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay. Um, this is old stuff, actually, Stormworm. I mean, as you see, it's two years old, and as it was new, many researchers got interested. So why did we care? I mean, this is boring stuff on the first sight. Well, actually, there was, except for Joe Stewart, who presented on this on Black Hat, that is what we know of, of course, there might be, have been more at various antivirus companies, was no real deep reverse engineering on this because it's heavily obfuscated. It's C++, multi-threaded. Even if it wouldn't be obfuscated, it is a pain in the ass to debug this whole beast. So what people did is they, they just ran it in a, in a VMware and looked like what it behaves. So. Uh, this is the reason why, why a lot of the initial research was very fuzzy or just plain wrong or not very accurate because people just took a sandbox, ran it in there and did some dynamic analysis. And what we did, uh, or what mainly Felix did, is the manual reverse engineering of the malware. And then we developed a solution to then overtake the botnet from the findings. So our new findings, just as you see, what we did, or what Felix uh, Reverse engineered is first the, the generation algorithm for the CNC lookup hash because um, others just ran it in, in, a, in a sandbox each day for 32 times or even for 200 times to find out what to search for in the uh, in the peer to peer network. We just can give you the algorithm now. Then how are these uh, command and control hosts encoded in the search results because it's not just IP as a string and then uh, the port or something, it's actually encoded there somehow. We can tell you how that is encoded. And then, how does the command protocol work? People just ran it in a, a virtual machine and said, oh, this is, uh, this is probably an update because it contains an URL or something like this. Reverse, uh, reverse engineering now shows you what commands are there actually. And then there's a challenge response. I mean, you could tell, okay, this is probably a challenge response, but you could not actually authenticate to a real command and control server because you didn't know how the challenge response algorithm worked. It's actually a boring sort, but you need to know that. How does the update command actually work and how to update? And then what we then did is we built a disinfector. So we don't want, uh, if, if we can overtake a storm node, we are white hats, of course, 
we also want to disinfect it from Storm. So we wrote a simple disinfector that terminates the running instance of Stormworm, which is not so easy because it injects itself into services access, so you cannot just use terminate process for it. And then also removes the on-disk binaries of Storm. Yeah. And actually, we have working implementation code that is going to be least rated today. Uh, that, for example, hash generation C. And this is our is only our only pieces of the puzzle that are going to be released today. And later, maybe we will even release something more. Let's see, or someone else will put it together. We don't know. And um, that's what we did. So, what was very funny during this research was actually tracking the trackers. Because if you look into the peer-to-peer -peer network, you see some peers are highly active and they, they do some eye-catching stuff. Because if you look at the hashes here, they are largely the same and they only differ in the first byte. So why does somebody do this? They flood the network with search requests. The reason is that they wanted to enumerate all peers in the peer-to-peer -peer network to, uh, to see uh, which commuters are infected. But the way they did it, instead of passively listening, but actively pushing a lot of requests was very, very noisy. So uh, here are a couple of universities that actually made their hosts very visible. There is the University of San Diego. There is uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology, the University of Michigan, and then the University of Mannheim, which just very easily revealed which hosts are crawling. So I mean, if I would run the storm botnet, I would just have DDoS these computers. And then also the Institute Uricom was, as I know, uh, used the connection of the University of Mannheim to do the same research. So they crawled this peer-to-peer -peer network. And um, yeah, I would have done it more passively, me maybe. But yeah, that's up to them actually. So these are some interesting host names, just by the way. So uh, how does this whole peer-to-peer -peer stuff work? And let's get some peer-to-peer -peer theory about the from Mark. So. <coughs> Yeah, um, thank you, Georg. Um, we will now go a little bit deeper into the peer-to-peer -peer details of uh, Stormworm, of the communication. I think from some of you who perhaps spent some time or read something about the Stormworm, some papers or the diploma thesis um, that was done on, the, on this uh, bot, they already, uh, then you already know the stuff that I'm going to tell you. But um, nevertheless, we have a huge uh, audience here, so we have to um, talk about this again. <coughs> so. Um, um, Stormworm uses uh, some components for its communication, and these are the both um, the both yeah, components. It's the OverNet protocol they use, so it's mainly it was used in eDonkey, and um, it uses the Kademlia DHT algorithm for routing in this through this protocol over this protocol. So um, <coughs> yeah. Um, the, they at first they were using the OverNet infrastructure of eDonkey, so they at first just um, used the same protocol with no encryption as eDonkey did uh, use it. So they had uh, they could reuse the infrastructure of, of that and um, yeah start with several or start with a few um, a few amount of nodes um, yeah. And 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 um, they didn't have to uh, have a huge network where routing is, is perfect at the at the start. And then later, when they had enough nodes, they changed to use encryption, to the usage of encryption. So they separated their P2P network from the uh, from the eDonkey network, and this uh, was done by s simply using a static SOAR key that is in the binary in each Stormworm binary. And uh, by this, they encrypted. Uh, they just sorted the packets, and so. Normal eDonkey nodes would uh, not be able to recognize the packets that are coming, and so they have a really separate network. And you can ensure, you can be sure that if you get packets that are encrypted by this SOAR key and you decrypt them and look at them and you see the um, the bytes, yeah, we see this on the next slide, I think. No, not on the next slide, but um, yeah, then the, you can be sure that this is a storm node, really, that you are get a, that you are getting packets from. So um, the second thing is um, the Kademlia DHT uh, algorithm. Um, just here's a slide for a short uh, overview over DHT. So D DHT is a distributed hash table um, where nodes and content uh, are identified by hashes. So it provides some means of um, routing and finding um, content or other nodes through searching for some specific hashes. And these hashes are, oh, we have this on the next slide, um, are of 128-bit length in the, this Kademlia DHT algorithm. So uh, you have a structured key-based routing, and um, 
then in a DHG, each node is responsible for a part of the key space. So if you want to place some content there, then it's some node is responsible for that content, and the lookup will end up, a lookup for this content will end up at this, at this node, and this node then knows how to retrieve the content. And this is the same, or this, this t technique is used by Storm. Um, yeah, this is a cool stuff because uh, you can efficient search, efficiently search in this network. You have a uh, search complexity of log n if you, if you use a storage of log n, but that's probably just uh, a fact for you here. Um, yeah, Kademnia is, DH, is this DHD routing algorithm, 128-bit identifiers for nodes and content. Um, and it uses SOAR as its distance metric. So if you want to know how far away are you from a certain hash or for, from a certain node, then you just XOR them, and then you have the most significant bit that differs is the XOR distance then. Um, this is uh, really important because, um, yeah, as you will see later, this XOR distance metric and the DHT, how is it, how it is working, is the basic or the first step in our attack and the first step that is, uh, yeah, kind of vulnerable to, for, uh, so that we can use it and exploit it. Um, yeah, if a node uh, wants to join the network, then it needs to bootstrap. It, um, every storm node knows some nodes in the, uh, they are, there's a peers list in the binary itself, so they know some nodes that are probably up uh, when, they, when, it, when a machine is infected. So um, then it uh, connects, yeah, it, it sends messages to these nodes. We will see the specific messages in a few uh, seconds. And then uh, it, with, the, with these connections, that it, with these bootstrapping um, methods, it uh, populates its routing tables. And these routing tables, they have uh, in Kademlia, they have um, 128 buckets. So we have 128 bit identifiers, and one for, for each distance you can have from one hash, you have a bucket that you store some nodes of, uh, of that specific distance in. So if you want to look, ah, I think we have it on the next slide. I'm a little bit too too fast here. Okay, so here, this is, this is the um, thing why we need these 128 buckets. So if you want to find a certain hash x, then uh, y uh, a node, the node that wants to find this hash um, queries the peers that are closest to x uh, according to the, to the XOR metric. So it looks up in this routing table, um, the, the hash I want to find is of distance, I th whatever, 100. So I look in my bucket 100 if I have some, some nodes in there. If I haven't, I go uh, some, some buckets away and, and then I choose other nodes. But uh, basically, I want to send my queries uh, the, the nearest pos to the nearest possible nodes. And um, yeah, then these nodes that I send the queries to, they uh, respond with more peers nearer to the target again. Or uh, they respond with a, you can, you can send, if they are near enough, you can send it a direct search query, and then you get the search result. So uh, in th by this, by this uh, algorithm, it is ensured that each iteration will find, s will find nodes closer to the key. So it actually, yeah, will not, will not en uh, go into an endless loop or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, this is a little example, a little, uh, um, yeah. Uh, picture of this. So uh, here we have a node AAAA, and uh, if it wants now to find some some hash FFFF, for example, then it will ask uh, some node that it knows that is nearer to the hash, or some other node, and uh, this node then responds with some again some other node that is nearer to the hash, and so on. So we just skip through this. Uh, it's basically just the same as I just said. So um, in the end, it will end up as at the node F000, and this node will probably, yeah, in, in, in this example, it is near enough, so then this node is, um, can tell you where, you where to find your content. Um, yeah, and then this, this, this is a search algorithm. So um, this is basics of DHT. This will be the basic, basics of DHT, and now some deeper insight into the protocol itself. As it is uh, overnet, it uses UDP IP. And each message um, starts with two bytes. It's the um, hexadecimal uh, 0xe3. This is the eDonkey magic number for messages. And then there's an opcode of the message. And we have different message types, as we see in the next slides. And uh, this is, of course, if you just see some packets on the network, this is, of course, sort then with, uh, with this uh, encryption, so you don't see the E3 directly on the wire, but you have to decrypt, and then you see E3, so you can check if it is a valid uh, eDonkey message. 
And some uh, in this overnet protocol, a peer consists of its uh, MD4 hash, it's the, the, this is the identifier, then it has an IP and port, and it ha also has a peer type, which is actually, um, yeah, most of the time I think it was zero in our, in our findings, but it could be used to, to distinguish between peers. So we have uh, sev several messages for maintaining connectivity and getting connectivity. And uh, there is the publicize message, message type um, that just says, hello, um, are you there? Then uh, the node, if, if it is actually there, then the node which you sent this message to, it acts the message. And then you know, OK, there is some, somebody on the other side. I send him a connect. And a connect uh, is basically a second hello that is then responded to with a list of peers. So this, this is uh, used to gain connectivity in this network. <coughs> you send to other nodes, you send connect messages, and they give you back some other nodes they know and they are connected to. So you can uh, populate your routing tables. This is used in the bootstrapping sequence. Um, there's also a message identify. Um, you can use it to enumerate other peers' information. This is, for example, uh, good to know uh, to check if you're um, behind, an, behind a network uh, address translation as uh, if another peer says I am at IP 0000 or I have a local area network IP, then it's probably behind a, a network address translation. So um, yeah, identify reply, it g uh, contains this information. Um, then you have uh, more messages for the search. For the search algorithm, there's a search message type. Um, this is initiating a search for some hash. So you send search query by this message type to other nodes. Um, these nodes then have, um, yeah, then respond with search next messages. They contain, again, more peers that are for, for them in their routing uh, tables are nearer to the, to the target hash. And um, if you are near enough, or, or if the target node that you're querying is near enough to the hash that you're searching, you don't send a search, but you send a get search result directly. So it, you say, you are very near to my target that I want to find, so give me the search results. And then the, um, is this actually not on the slide, but there's a message type that is, uh, says no result. So the node can then respond with a result um, or say, I have no result, ask somebody else. And this search result message actually, uh, is there multiple times. So you get, if you say get for search result, you get multiple search result messages. And uh, then after, they are, after the other node is done with that, you get a search end message. Yeah. Um, this is, again, a little picture to emphasize this. Um, it's really easy. Node publicizes, it gets an egg, it connects, it gets some peers back from connect reply. Uh, this is done to several peers, of course. And then if you want to search something, you send a search. And now um, if the node B is far from your target, according to the, to the XOR metric again, then you get search next with other peers. And if, you, if node B is near to the, to the peer, then you uh, send a get search result. And you get multiple search results back. And then you get a search end back. Um, now I have, I have a, a little picture of Wireshark um, of actual communication with such a node. So it's just to, to repeat or to show you that this is actually what happens. Um, you have in the top the publicized messages. Actually, you have the publicized messages multiple times and also the connect messages because you want to uh, maintain connectivity and you want to stay connected to the node so that it does not uh, push you out of its routing tables and, and stuff. So you have to, or the nodes, actually, they send, it, send their messages multiple times. They are their publicizers. And if you would now look into this, uh, e-donk, this eDonkey UDP search message, then we would, see the, um, we would see the actual one of the hashes that Storm uses to find its command and control servers. So these are the messages that we are, um, that we are basically, yeah, at, in, at first, uh, w we are interested in. And also all the guys that put uh, Stormworm into a sandbox, they filtered for these search messages and then saw the search hashes that are in, in the end ending up at the, um, with a result uh, that contains the, the CNC server. Um, yeah, and this, this um, as Georg already said, this, um, search, uh, this search hash that Storm actually searches for is um, generated in a kind of obfuscated fashion in Storm. So nobody, they, they, so, this, so uh, the people put the Storm into their sandboxes and didn't uh, reverse engineer it, but we did, and we can give you the code for that. 
and uh, this is cool to monitor it and also to uh, this is important to our attack so um, now the interesting part probably for everyone the, the cool things um, the vulnerability um, is the first thing of the vulnerability is the um, the, me the possibility to do a simple attack uh, in a DHT network in a DHT routing so um, you can because of uh, because of the fact that nodes try to um, route their search queries to the to the most to the nearest peers to the uh, t search target, um, you can um, through the Sybil attack um, announce you yourself to a specific node that you want to that you want to uh, intercept search queries from. You can announce yourself with a hash that is really near to the target hash that it will search for. So if we know node B, w node or no the storm node, will search for uh, hash F or, or Fx, and we uh, say we are Fa, then it probably will send its request to us. So, um, yeah, this is the first thing that is important. Um, yeah, the second thing is that um, this, the command and control server, it's encoded in the search result. And this was, um, yeah, as we as we know, uh, not, not reverse engineered uh, until now. So uh, Felix did uh, spend much time in in the code and in the assembly, and then he found out how actually the search results can be um, can be decoded into the the command and control server port and IP that we have to connect to. Um, yeah, and this also is for our for our exploit and for our overtake. This is really uh, for for our takeover. It's really important because. We can, if we intercept search queries, we can give them back search results that actually give them not the real command and control server, but give them our command and control server. And we can lure them into connecting to us instead of connecting to the real command and control. Um, yeah, and the third, third thing, uh, we already said that, but um, so Storm searches for 32 pre-computable hashes uh, per day. This is missing here. It's actually dependent on the time. So the, these 32 hashes, they, um, they change uh, d with time. So you have to, each day you have uh, different 32 hashes. But um, they are pre-computable and we can just do a little, code a little C program and we actually have that um, computes these 32 hashes and then you can um, then you can search for these hashes to monitor, or you can announce yourself with hashes near these 32, and then intercept all the search queries and give, an, give them your own um, command and control server. This is, um, the, this is important to mention because um, if you normally would, have, would, would like to intercept the search queries in this network, you would have to introduce 10,000 or, or more to, to, to the power of 16, I think, uh, was mentioned in some talk, nodes into the network to intercept all search queries over the network. And this is certainly, yeah, for a takeover, this is not really cool because uh, you have, don't have uh, that many, yeah, this, this high bandwidth and this many machines. So we don't need that. We just, uh, yeah can use these 32 hashes to um, put ourselves in the place for interception of the search queries. And this can be done with one machine and one single script or process. Yeah, um, basically, here a, a little picture. We will uh, introduce ourselves to the network. We will publicize and connect into the network uh, with a hash that is uh, if we think of the example that we had before, that is ba basically the F001 because the search queries will end up at us and we can then give them our search result instead of the real one. Yeah, and uh, this is basically about the peer-to-peer -peer workings and now, um, yeah, the interesting stuff and work to, uh, in, in case, in, in uh, yeah, scope of re reverse engineering. Okay. Okay. Right. Hello? Yes? Okay. Uh, I got some sound. All right. Um, so, so much about the details. What you have to keep in mind is um, Storm uses peer to peer to get the command server. You can think about this being any file. Uh, um, the files are represented by hashes, as Mark said. So if you hear the term search hash, you can think ab about your favorite peer-to-peer um, -peer 
tool and um, a search for any file like uh, my favorite porn.avi or whatever, right? Um, so there's one thing um, about our source code because all the stuff is already implemented. You don't have to re-implement it yourself. And um, those guys have used the cat C library. Um, anybody here a developer of the cat C library? Lucky you. <laughs> because um, I've reversed the library and find out, found out that it is cat C they are using. And then I said, wow, this is cool, so I can have a look at the source code. But actually, I, it was easier to look at the binary than the source code. Um, <laughs> and I'm not the only one thinking that, because the developers of Storm, you know, they include this encryption, as um, Mark mentioned. And what they did is they added this encryption just before the send and removed it afterwards because they couldn't understand what's happening somewhere else in this library, <laughs> right? So nobody understands that except probably the developers, I hope at least. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to show you some details about the reverse engineering. If there are people here that are into reverse engineering, um, some of the stuff is not, not so new, it's uh, just standard, but um, uh, my motivation is to get people into reverse engineering that are not already, all right? So if you find all this stuff interesting, I'm telling now, come to our workshop tonight and um, we can show you a little more tricks, all right? Oh, which room is it? It's starting at uh, 8 o'clock? A3. Well, uh, we are there for questions, but we only have 10 seats, all right? <laughs> okay, um, the first thing you need for, unpack uh, for uh, reverse engineering is um, best to have something that you can run in a debugger or... Um, yeah, disassembling program. My favorite is IDA Pro, as is the um, favorite of many other people. Um, you should definitely get a copy of the free version if you want to start um, um, analyzing executables. And um, the debugger is crap, but what's cool is browsing the executables. And uh, we used it to do the static analysis of um, Storm, which means that we looked at the binary and what's happening there, control flow and stuff, without executing it in IDA. And then you can rename variables and functions and whatever. And it's um, pretty cool to browse through the source code. Um, but in, well, not source code, um, <laughs> when I mean source code, it's assembly. Um, okay, so what we tried first is um, we built a decryptor for Storm in order to, um, when a new version is coming out, so that we can um, get a fresh copy of, of the code and have a look at it. Um, then we came across some or got some hints from, from others, that we can just do a memory dump and um, reconstruct the import table, and it worked well, um, because um, Storm is loading the whole executable in memory after unpacking, even with their headers. Okay, there's a, a second tool you need, which is a debugger, because you may discover the logic using a disassembler, but you cannot really have a look at what values are inside the variables and stuff. This is pretty hard and takes a lot of time if you want to do it with just a static analysis tool. So um, what we did is we linked all the information we got from IDA from our manual analysis, static analysis, and used them in, in, um, in the immunity debugger. So that we got all the information from our static analysis tools in the immunity debugger, which is a lot helpful if you can um, use names there and stuff. Um, and here comes the cool stuff. Because um, all the stuff, all the storm code is extracted into heap memory and run in heap memory, all right? And there's only one point where you can be sure um, that breakpoints stay where they are. And this is right after the start, right after unpacking. So we have built a small de decryptor stop and um, um, a script that's watching storm as it's getting unpacked. And once it's unpacked, uh, we can install everything we want. And we used it for breakpoints, patches, and... Um, all other stuff like um, VM detection, patching out and stuff. All right, um, this is, uh, those are two screenshots of uh, Lord P, which we use for dumping. And the only thing you have to do is uh, find the right memory region, the heap memory region, and uh, reconstruct the import table. And then for Storm, this is only for Storm, not if you want to do general reverse engineering. But for Storm, it works very well. Uh, you get the whole executable. And even with some yeah, import or function or external references. Okay, but back to the main topic, as um, Mark has mentioned, we need some search hash to find 
the control server. And this is what Storm does. It looks for a specific hash, like any file, and um, the response or the answer to the search, the res uh, search result, is telling you where the command server is located. And we need that in order to inject our own command server. Um, for the older versions of Storm which, with which we started, this was, this was pretty hard because um, somebody had used a POSIX library that was um, linked, or th this was, which was a Windows port, and um, they did some very fucked up operations. Um, newer versions, they are using the MSV CRT library, and it's straight straightforward. You can read everything out of there. And um, I uh, suspect that Joe Stewart um, had to wait for publishing his details for so long um, because um, he could just read out the simple stuff, but um, I'd like to talk to him personally on that. Okay, uh, what we did uh, um, differently than others, we re-implemented all this in C because we wanted to take over Storm. So um, in order to be efficient, we had to do some debugging. We patched out all the timeouts, um, even some control se sequences th so that we can come to the interesting parts more quickly. And we monitored the relevant functions. For example, um, send, when um, things are sent out um, to um, the network so that we can intercept, check is this the stuff we want to monitor, and if so, we looked at where are the buffers, like for example on the stack, and um, could crawl through the binary. Okay, um, as I said, the old stuff is um, pretty complicated. Um, I wanted to show it to you, like this is our disassembly. There was some strange function, mix time, and what we could identify very easily was that the whole buffer that is used after this mix time is XORed. All elements are XORed together, together and uh, all ele elements are added together. And um, this is how some uh, excerpt from mix time. And there are strange numbers. At first we thought, okay, this is some kind of encryption. But um, if you have a, look, a closer look, you will see that get system time is giving you the, the nanoseconds since um, uh, 1601, the year 1601, and um, Storm wants to use Unix time. All right, so uh, this is just some simple conversion, but um, um, it was easy to find a candidate, but um, all the stuff um, and seeing the logic behind it was um, pretty hard at first. Um, it's a lot easier if you have a look at the newer versions, right? There's just a call to time, and then you can see um, the days, years, month, day of week, and so are put into a buffer and um, XORed and added together. Okay, this is illustrated here. So what we need is, um, we need the day, the weekday, month, year, low and high byte, and um, there's uh, two checksums done on that. Furthermore, there are some pretty strange operations, like um, two of those um, date informations are um, um, divided, they are multiplied, modded, and so on. And um, this doesn't really have make any sense. So it's just for obfuscation. And what was that question? <laughs> Seems not. Um, and the point is why this is working is because, this is actually the good point about Storm. Um, let's, no, let's start differently. Um, you know, th the guys that are normally affected by Storm are not um, the elite computer users. And you know what, what's um, the biggest problem for those guys? Keeping their time in sync, right? Um, and actually Storm does that for them, <laughs> right? So isn't that a great feature? Come on! <laughs> all right, and Storm has to do this because um, the hashes have to be the same for all hosts across the world, right? And they are all getting um, the GM time, which is the same for all hosts in the world. And so all hosts for a specific day um, have the same hashes. Then you take specific information, do some um, stupid integrity checks like XOR all the elements, um, add all the elements, uh, which is just some obfuscation and um, some other strange stuff. And at the end, you use a static XOR key to encrypt the stuff, all right? Um, if this is really encryption or not, um, I'm leaving this to you. Actually, it's a symmetric key encryption, but um, it's not very valuable. All right. Um, as mentioned before, they are 32 different. And this is because of a random value that's at the end added to all those elements. 
And that's the whole magic. Here's the C code. Um, as mentioned before, no need to take out your notepads and write it down now um, because we are publishing that, okay? So um, we implemented that and um, looked at where do the hashes lead? Can we um, have other peers connect to us because we are very close to the hash? And uh, what about the hash results? But um, the problem was at that point, the hashes didn't lead to any hosts we knew, right? So there were the search hashes which we could answer. We could, could be uh, the closest, the best ones um, to the close to that hash. So we could print, uh, practically say, um, we know where the file is that you need, all right? If the file is um, similar as the command control server. Okay. Um, so what we found out is that there is no correlation between the result that gets returned after the search and the actual command and control server that is used. So there must be some information in the result that redirects all the bots to some other server. Okay, um, this, this gets us to the second hash we are going to look at, uh, result hashes, because you're not getting an IP address in Overnet or um, uh, a port or whatever, you're getting a hash as a result. And so we had a closer look at um, those hashes. And um, in order to get some useful information about those hashes, we um, used a debugger and um, um, did some data flow tracking on the static part um, to find the position, to, pu to find the function inside the original storm where this stuff is parsed and what happens there. Once we found this function, it was um, maybe half an hour work or maybe an hour um, to get C code out of that. Um, we had to redo it a few times because um, of the Kademlia library, cat C, because it's using so many threads that you get totally confused by looking at it, right? So we had to do this um, again and again and restart the debugger and um, to be a bit faster, we, even, we patched out um, some timeouts that Storm is using and um, the control flow which we knew could, um, could be stepped over. And what we got as a result is um, that of the hashes, the result hashes, okay, that's not now not the search hashes, that's the result hash we, we are getting back. Um, the upper four bits are always random. They're just crap. They are not used at all. Um, in the zero bits of each byte in the hash, there's a checksum. Um, the lower eight bits are a sum checksum, all elements added together. The upper eight bits are an XOR checksum. Um, in the one bits, we got the port the client is connected to. So this is the actual port of the command and control server. And the bits two and three is um, the IP address of the command and control server. And the whole thing is, in, is um, encoded using the same static XOR key as the search queries. So um, the good Storm guys implemented one static XOR key encryption and used it everywhere, right? Um, easy for us. Okay, here is the whole thing a little illustrate. I'm sorry for the colors. I lost some slides and had to do, redo them very quickly. Um, I hope you're not getting blind now. Um, okay, so the, the bit number four is having the IP low bit. Then the next bit three has um, IP high bit. Um, here's the port and here's the checksum. So this is how it works. And um, knowing all this, right, this is the C code, knowing all this, uh, we were able to tell the bots where to connect to to get commands. All right. First, we uh, injected the search hashes, saying, "We got, we know the results. We know where your command and control server is located." And then we said, "Okay, the command and control server is our machine." And um, this is the actual code, which you don't have to write down. You know. Um, okay. And what happens then is, the bot connects to the server we announced using um, TCP. There's um, a challenge response, another XOR key. This one is different now. And um, if this response is correct, um, the server is answering our requests. Okay, the whole thing is, um, is really highly encrypted. 
I don't know if you know the Zlib encryption, <laughs> right? Who of you does not know Zlib encryption? Okay, uh, Zlib is just a packer, right? They just pack all the stuff. It's uh, plain text ASCII what they send. Um, zip. What, what's um, interesting about it is um, that the bots or zombies, they pull the information. So they ask in the server, um, do you have any news for me? If so, uh, please send them. Then the server sends back. But the server is not giving the commands. It's actually the client asking for commands. Um, old versions had like around 12 commands. Newer versions have 14. Um, I'm not sure if we got the latest, but um, our last sample is from like, like somewhere September, October, maybe there are newer commands. Um, I have to admit, we have worked on, um, um, oh, yes? Okay, the question is if they had used um, um, proper encryption like um, public key encryption, um, authentic or authentication, right? Um, the whole thing would, be, um, would not be possible. Um, well, what we could do is we could still connect because we know all the client stuff, right? We could, uh, we could authenticate to the server. But uh, what we wanted to do is we want to implement the server and that would not be, have been possible then because we would have needed the keys on the server. Um, this is for all the hackers out, say, out there um, that then see a machine and maybe um, hijack that machine, get down the, the keys from um, the, uh, the commanding server and whatever. But the problem here is also that um, the commanding servers are also peers. They are not the ones that are controlled by the owners of the botnet. So um, it wouldn't be any use to have the keys inside one of those command servers because they could be hijacked as well because they are just, any, just peers like all the others, right? But still the commands could have been signed and that would have, make it, would have made it very much harder for us. Okay, here's how the protocol looks like after Zlib encryption, okay? Um, first, the client sends some hello message saying, okay, hello, my name is my computer. This is the actual computer name. Um, I'm running Windows XP Service Pack 2, and uh, my ID is this up there. And um, then the server answers, okay, your external host name is uh, this, and this is your IP address. So always nice to know if you're netted or whatever to get your outside IP address. Okay, this has been known before, this uh, handshake and... Um, the Zlib encryption, because you can black box that. Um, then there's a second command, which also has a number two. Um, there's number two, um, the same ID and some other stuff, which is not so important here. And what's, what all the guys that have black boxed have always seen is a one and um, colon. No, 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 what's? Exclamation, exclamation mark. Thank you. Um, so a one and an exclamation mark. That's all that I've ever seen. So they thought, okay, it's part, probably part of the hello, like a second stage or whatever. Uh, we will come to that point um, on the next slide. Okay, um, the next step is to request the DDoS targets. So right now that we are the command server, we could DDoS anybody who we don't like. Um, and the best is we can send spam, right? <laughs> right. Um, we, um, we haven't done that yet um, because I don't know any good text and I'm not a good writer. So if you have a good text, um, <laughs> please come to me and we can have a look if we... <laughs> what? what? All right, Mrs. Christmas, maybe the original executable, right? Um, okay, um, so this number two was somehow suspicious to us. It, has, it had no use at all and nobody knew what it was for. Um, so we had a closer look into the assembly source code. And there was some strange update thing, right? There, the string update is found at multiple places there. But here it was somehow suspicious. And at that point, we could also identify the functions for all commands that are sent out, right? So we were pretty far ahead um, during that phase. And um, by injecting fake responses into memory, we didn't even have to wait for or um, fake real command servers, we can, could just go to that point in the code and, and check what's happening there. And so we just alter the, co the, the control flow um, to get to this point only. And if you have a look, at this point, um, 
it's already pretty obvious what's happening. Okay, um, pretty obvious if you know how to um, adjust all the blocks because um, I didn't have time to adjust them, sorry. Um, so the first thing that is done is um, here on the right, from your point, uh, from your point of view on the right, um, there's a string copy happening to update. Okay, sounds very interesting. Um, if this is really update, and there are some other conditions that are true, there is an HTTP download command that is, um, yeah, executed, and um, with this binary, there's a create process call afterwards. And this sounded very, very interesting to us. Um, so we tried that, and um, we were pretty successful, right? So after knowing the search hash and um, so telling everybody we know the results to the search as you are doing, um, then in the results saying, okay, this is the server you need to connect to, and then when they connect, we just send the update, and this update is really run on the machine. So um, we could inject like any executable we wanted to into the system. And now the point is, once you're on the machine, you want to remove the old storm worm because um, they may, have, may upload binaries too. And so then it's a war, which binary is the strongest and um, is harder to disinfect and stuff. So the first thing we do is when entering a machine is to disinfect it, right? Uh, remove the old storm worm. And, uh, oh, there's a question? Right. Right. Right, okay, the question was, why is, are those um, hashes really random? Or, well, there are 32 different hashes the bots are searching for, and if this is kind, some kind of load balancing, that's the question. Um, um, actually, we, right, it's, um, it's putting less load on the overall DHT, um, but um, it would also be possible, I think, um, even with just one hash. But, uh, right, everybody's asking, the, everybody's asking the same notes then. Okay, maybe we can uh, <laughs> do th take this discussion um, afterwards, right? Uh, because uh, Georg disagrees and um, <laughs> we have to fight this out internally before um, you get the boxing st equipment and while Till is telling you how to disinfect from Storm. Thank you. Yeah, okay, is it working? Um, <coughs> okay, here comes the final part. So uh, now we know how to um, gain control over Storm peer. And as Felix uh, already said, now the, the question is what can we possibly send to, to a storm peer and uh, execute there? And um, <coughs> the goal is, of course, to run, uh, terminate running instances. So uh, th there might be even uh, several instances running of different versions of storm on one machine. Um, the, the one thing we observed is that if you download storm, a storm sample from one of the web pages, for instance, the, uh, the Dancing Skeleton page. If you download the storm sample from there, you uh, get samples with different checksums. So it's some sort of polymorphism is implemented there. Um, I, I think it's not that you get a unique sample each time you download it, but um, yeah, it's at least we have several thousands of different samples. So what we cannot do is um, we cannot unpack it and yeah, do stuff with it. Um, so our strategy is we sh um, must enumerate all processes running on the system and check whether they are storm or not um, to identify the processes which we want to terminate. Um, and our strategy is that we scan the, the, the memory of each process and uh, yeah, by calling read process memory and then perform a simple pattern matching. And um, then we have a... Um, um, we have to be careful because some versions of Storm inject threads into services Exe or um, Explorer Exe. And in, in these cases, we cannot uh, simply terminate the process because if you terminate, terminate services Exe, you terminate Windows, and this is not what we want. Um, 
So in that case, we have to um, mark, um, we have to identify the image on disk. We have to mark it uh, so that it gets deleted uh, upon the next reboot. And then we have to, um, oh no, this is, a, is uh, the other case. Um, yeah, anyway, we have to, uh, if, if we can identify an image on disk, we have to delete it upon the next reboot. But in the case of, uh, of, an, of a standalone process, we, have to term we can simply terminate it. And if it's an injected thread, we um, need to, yeah, terminate the thread. And this is done by um, injecting some kind of shell code into the um, code segment of the thread. Uh, I guess I have a, a, a different slide, yeah. Um, the, the distinct pattern, the unique pattern, which can be used to identify a storm thread or a storm process is the XOR key. It is 40 bytes long, so um, we have a very uh, low false positive rate as uh, shown in the formula um, at the bottom of the slide. And um, yeah, we assume that it's safe to s simply scan for, for this pattern in the process memory, and if we find it, we can safely assume that it's storm. <coughs> yeah, uh, this is the, uh, the histogram of the, of the XOR key. Uh, Georg, you made it, and I guess you wanted to show that it's, yeah, results in the few false positives. Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, here's an example memory map. Um, we see, see services actually with, diff with different threads. Some have a PE header, some data sections, code sections. And at the bottom, there's a standalone process. And we can now uh, run through all memory um, sections and search for the, 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 the XOR key. By, um, we implemented the boyer move string matching algorithm because it's known to be one of the fast, uh, faster ones. And yeah, so we can now identify the threads and um, processes which are storm. And here is a shell code we inject into a thread because, as I said before, a process can simply be terminated. And if you can guess uh, which tool made this pretty graph, you <laughs> Marcus, you don't count, <laughs> then you uh, might be uh, a candidate for one of the beers. Uh, what? Yeah, uh, I mean, which tool created the dot file? <laughs> no, which tool created the dot file? Yeah. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, you get the beer. Um, okay, we, we reused existing shellcode here, um, which uh, does some PEB uh, uh, location thing for the, the exit thread um, AP call, and then finally calls it so that the, um, the, the, the um, current thread yeah, terminates itself. Um, yeah, what we do is uh, we, we spread an obsled uh, over the whole code section of the, of the, the identified thread and place this uh, little piece of shellcode at the very um, end of the, of the code section. Okay, uh, here, here are the final slides. Um, I want to say a few words about how you can actually take over the storm botnet. Um, what you can do with our approach is you can um, take over the network uh, from a single machine. But if you would do that, you would probably uh, get an implicit DDoS uh, because you receive so many uh, connecting, uh, you know, overnet messages that you basically cannot handle it. So you DDoS yourself in an implicit manner. But you would, would probably also get explicitly DDoS because there are pro most likely some people which are pissed off and, you know, <laughs> would DDoS you. Um, yeah, but if you want to make that experience yourself, you can use the code we uh, will be publishing maybe tonight or tomorrow once we figured out how to, yeah, email, attach it to an email. <laughs> okay, and um, the next step is, um, the next step is uh, what we, we thought about how can you, how can you prevent from being DDoS, uh, uh, prevent the DDoS attacks. You can um, take over Storm in a distributed manner. We already have a peer-to-peer -peer network by hand. So um, you could rec recursively disinfect it. We can, could start with one node, uh, which is marked red here. And this node can then um, inject this, uh, the, the modified, uh, the manipu manipulated hashes itself and automatically take over different uh, further nodes. So the next step would be it would take over these nodes and these would take over other nodes. So you will recursively take over the storm network. And yeah, this is, um, this is smart. This is fast, and it's not ready yet. <laughs> so,
actually you have to blame Felix because he uh, he didn't finish the reverse engineering part, uh, which is uh, yeah important for that part. Okay, now we come to the to the the interesting part of this, the talk. Uh, we will give you a short demonstration how to take over a storm running in a virtual machine. Right, because I, I need some time to prepare the setup, um, maybe uh, Georg can answer the question from here. Um, the question was, why are there 32 different hashes? Yeah, so it's, uh, it results in, a, in a, uh, some kind of load balancing. We don't know if they originally did it because of that, but it results in load balancing. Because if you, if you uh, think about DHT again, what, uh, what uh, Mark explained is that DHT works in a way you approach the node with the, with the hash closest to, to the hash you're searching. And if you only have one hash, that you're searching for, all nodes uh, searching for that one hash will in the end all be approaching the same peer in the routing algorithm. So having 32 different uh, hashes that are being searched for, this means that you're approaching 32 different hashes. This also uh, happens in the, the original overnet network where you actually have like hashes for keywords. So if you have the hash of the, the, the word the, the, the simple word the, the nodes that have an uh, ID close to this hash always get a lot of node, uh, a lot of load because these nodes have to get all the, the uh, cache all the results for, for files that have the in their file name. So actually, this is a kind of load balancing then. All right. Um, so let's start with the demo. Um, unfortunately, or no, we wanted to show you that we are not using a patched version of Storm, but we are using a real version. And unfortunately, Storm has some timeouts. So um, um, you've got to wait a bit. It all, all in all takes three minutes. I hope you have three minutes left. Thea? All right. Um, ooh. All right. What you see here is um, our storm sniffer. We've written a small tool that um, scans, um, um, does a PCAP capture or a network capture of um, all the storm traffic and uh, writes out the messages. Um, and I've already started in this window our um, so-called storm fucker, right? And uh, this storm fucker is announcing 32 hashes to the peer we want to overtake. Okay, this is a test setup just for sure, but um, we've tested in the, in the real storm botnet and uh, we can assure you, you can really take over nodes. Um, uh, no, no, this is not, I don't have internet connection, it's just a local setup, all right? Um, so, as you see, every five seconds, all 32 hashes are announced by um, our storm fucker. And now I'm using this um, virtual machine here um, to start the real storm. And um, as you see here now, msurf.exe um, is the storm node that's running now. Um, and what you will see is um, we, have, we are using calc.exe, which you know, Windows Calculator. Um, renamed to verifier.exe and upload this, and once this pops up, we know that we have overtaken um, the node, right? Because um, our storm fucker for sure is silent as well. You wouldn't see anything, and we want to show you something. Okay, um, what you will see in a, in a few moments here is um, the real storm node getting active. And it will send publicized messages as well, and connect mes messages to join the peer-to-peer -peer network, and also some other messages like, um, Get my get my external IP address and stuff. All right, here it is. And what you see in our storm fucker output over here is um, um, parts of the hash of the node that is um, that is connecting to us to the network. Okay, which is three three four seven and so on. But which is not the search hash, but just the hash of the node. Okay, here you see all the messages happening. You see there's lots of things happening if you have peer-to-peer. -peer. It's all UDP messages. Okay, let's get back to the virtual machine now. In a few seconds, the searches should be starting because at first, in the 30s, first 60 seconds, there's just some connection uh, phase, bootstrap phase, to get the node into the real peer-to-peer -peer network to get connectivity to as many nodes as possible. And only after that, the searches are starting. So, and this should begin Ooh. I don't takes a little longer actually th that's the boots ah, okay here we go here we get um, the searches and because we are simulating th uh, 32 
um, different nodes with 32 different hashes, um, we are getting lots of traffic and lots of search requests. And um, now Storm is collecting those search replies that we are sending back from different nodes. And zup, there it is, <laughs> right? All right, what if I tell you that I've installed a cron job here? <laughs> All right, um, now here's the verify exe, we, exe uh, which we um, uploaded here. And if I terminate this, um, the card will close. So it's not the original card. Uh, it's not a proof, but um, I, hope you, I hope you believe me at this point. Okay, um, there's one last myth I want to uh, um, show you. Um, there are lots of researchers that did black box testing and saying, okay, Storm is now using an encrypted protocol. And those um, protocol, uh, this protocol always starts with a um, hex 29 or 29 or uh, lower values. Um, actually, it's not encrypted, even though um, its entropy is very high. Um, and the entropy is very high because it's random data, <laughs> right? Uh, Storm is using this to uh, do timing measurements to find the commanding peer that's closest to it. And, um, well, I guess that's the thing most people think is encrypted because of its high entropy. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Um, are there any questions? Right, because um, the first six people asking questions get a beer. Um, okay, I think you were the first over there. Oh, no, oh, oh, I've got to get the microphone. Okay, then over here. <laughs> okay, sorry, hard to see. Right. Um, about authentication again. Right. Multiple times, um, then you could be that, right? Right. If they were like um, um, public, private, key encrypted, we couldn't do anything. Okay, okay. Um. <laughs> Can I have? Uh, sure. Okay. So actually, there's a lot of researchers that say there is RSRSA public key authentication in Stormworm. Uh, and actually, there, uh, it is believed, I mean, we didn't find anything of this. So it's, but we didn't look at all code, or Felix didn't look at all code. Uh, but um, there are some researchers that say there's RSA, and the, 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 the code path that is supposed to be authenticated by RSA is what turns a normal node into a controlling node. So only the storm warm um, people can, can activate command and control nodes actually. And these then start proxying these command and control connections. But we don't, so the, the public key uh, authentication is one layer above the layer we're attacking because we're just saying, oh, we're the command control layers uh, nodes on the, on the uh, peer to peer level. So um, they actually should have just signed the commands instead of signing who is the command and control server. So we could circumvent this if there's actually RSA because we did never see it. This is just what we read on some papers. There was a question hey there. in the back over there. Right. Hi. Um, terrific job you've been doing there. Um, first of all, what kind of measures have you been taking to prevent your botnet to be re-overtaking? Um, we um, haven't... Um, um, well, that's yeah, actually, actually, that's details, huh? uh, right? First, first of all, we do not maintain our own botnet. Uh, <laughs> this is, <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, we have implemented measures to uh, uh, re-overtake it afterwards. So our our um, implementation has several buffer overflows, possibly um, for sure, and we can use these to uh, regain control. So, so should we consider this to be a smart question, worth a beer, or yeah, come to the front and get your beer? <laughs> uh, you said earlier that um, you didn't think the Storm botnet was written by Russians, um, but you thought that it might have been had American cultural origins. Can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, so this is not, not our assumption. So that's, as I've said, there's a lot of research, and this was actually public research. So what I don't know who had said, but there was someone else. Uh, they most of the servers. 
that you're connecting to actually are in Russia, but they are assumed to be proxies because um, the, the actual email campaigns, the spam campaigns, are very well adjusted to American culture. So uh, it's believed that the, the, the physical persons running this are Americans or might be some Western-oriented, maybe Germans. Um, whoever, because... Uh, no, not for sure. No. <laughs> How do we all know this stuff? <laughs> uh, anyway, so because um, it's, it's targeted on Halloween and Christmas and strippy Christmas, so probably, uh, I don't know, some per person from a very conservative uh, country with conservative religion might not f have chosen a stripping center because you don't have center in that culture, Santa Claus, uh, or some, some stuff like this. So they're believed to be some Western-oriented country, and yeah, maybe it's even Russians. You can't tell that for sure because they did a good, stuff, uh, a good job at hiding because that's also, besides Peter Peer has advantage, you cannot take it down. It's also very hard to track the person that gives the commands if you do it properly. All right. Um, do you come forward to get your beer? Um, do you have any, any idea why they didn't use the hash of IP and port of the, for the nodes to generate the nodes ID as it is common in many DHTs? Because that would circumvent exactly your attack to pl place yourself close to the hashes that so are searched for. Are so basically, um, to, to do this properly, you need to know your external IP address. And um, to get your external IP address in, in the overnight protocol, you n need to already have a hash. And actually, uh, or you enumerate your local IPs, but that doesn't work if you're not it. You bootstrap your node. You're on the first contact to the, your bootstrapping node. Your bootstrapping node could tell you your external IP. Yeah, but this, this doesn't work for the... O so if you design the protocol accordingly, this is okay, but okay. in the overnight protocol, this doesn't work like this. So you would have to first send... Uh, so the, the message that gets you your external IP already contains your own hash, and this is then first announced. So this doesn't work. And also, the other thing is that uh, for DHT to work, you want to have a uniformly distributed uh, hash, a ring of hashes, and um, if, you, if you want to have a uniformly distributed <coughs> ring, and this is your only requirement, then just do it randomly. That's statistically, if you have enough nodes, this is uniformly distributed, of course. Okay. Um, this, my question is meant to be serious. Is it legal to clean a host by your methods? Um, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, and we didn't do that on hosts we didn't own. Um, <laughs> plus, um, there is... There is some countries where it might be legal for certain persons. So that's why we are. Um, um, that's why we only cleaned up our own hosts. All right, but it's working. Hmm. <sighs> yes. uh, have you searched how the commands come to the command service in Shane? You know they got that come from somewhere. Sorry. You have command service, but where do those servers get the commands from? Uh, right. Um, on the, we are still reversing on the, on the, full, on the full thing, right? Um, but um, you, are, you can be a potential command server if you are not uh, network address translated, right? And if you're not network address translated and you know any other command server, you connect to this command server um, telling him that um, you're not network address translated, and um, you open some specific ports on which you can accept commands, right? And um, uh, we suspect that um, those information are um, propagated throughout the peer-to-peer -peer network too, to uh, specific hosts, right? Um, there are also some information um, for, from the black boxes. Uh, we are still reversing on the full protocol. Um, some more details are found in, in different black box papers as far as I know. Not on the actual protocol, but on the um, network relations. Uh, okay, I have a question. How much damage could you realistically do to the storm botnet? I mean, what percentage of nodes do you think you could, could destroy if you just attack now? And why won't you do that? Uh, could you stand up and raise the question again? Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so if, if you wanted to attack Storm botnet today, what percentage of the nodes do you think you could take down? 
Yeah, um, the, as Felix said before, um, there's a, um, a tiny part of the, of the protocol we didn't reverse engineer yet. So we are um, pretty sure that we could um, take over all nutted nodes, so all nodes which are behind network address translation, which uh, is uh, probably the majority of the nodes. Or do you want, do you want to have numbers? <laughs> because, because that's the problem. Um, the size of the storm botnet varies a bit, right? Um, I think the largest we have seen is like 40,000 nodes, right? Yeah, I think so. At, yeah. at once, 40, yeah, 40,000 nodes. So um, we can take up to 40,000 nodes, which uh, should be enough for any DDoS, right? Yeah, it's important to, to understand that we didn't implement a tracker, so we, we don't crawl the storm botnet and count peers. So we can only estimate the number of peers. Okay. Can I? Okay, so uh, now guys, we have a lot of experience uh, with vulnerabilities of botnets. My question is, uh, do you plan to publish documents of paper uh, with recommendation and security advices uh, how to propose really secure botnet network? <laughs> <laughs> So to write your own uh, good, secure, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, botnet, um, well, I have to be sure I'm not getting into 202C, the German paragraph here. Um, use public key authentication. Um, for example, if you, strip, if you would strip down OpenSSL and compile it for Windows, ECC public key uh, encryption is only 50 kilobytes more to the binary in theory, m probably. Um, and also, um, don't, use, don't use DHT, actually, if you use an unstructured P2P approach because you just want to flood out. And also, uh, regarding one of the earlier questions, um, uh, why or if of the, about the legality and the legal aspects of that, um, if we push out the, the code for all the parts that were missing up until now in the research, and we push out code to overtake a node, then, uh, yeah, perhaps there is some more gray or black hat guy who would, would clean up the botnet or whatever, do whatever with it. But um, yeah, <coughs> we, won't, we won't take over the botnet, so. Yeah, so if you release the cleanup code and, and the, the distributed cleanup stuff, maybe I'll someone else push the button, but we won't. Because it's illegal in Germany and even, even the rele uh, releasing the code with all pieces is illegal because of the infamous 202C. So because you can take over a computer with this, so we won't be releasing only bits and pieces and someone else has to assemble this. But maybe someone else will post it to the mailing list in the following days, who knows? <laughs> so much for the disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. uh, how long did it take to use the whole uh, research and especially the part of reverse engineering? Um, so, so the question was, um, how long it took how us? Long did it take? Yeah. Okay, there's um, a, a great new law in, in Germany, um, which is called a parental leave, and you get paid for that. And um, um, I had some time uh, because, um, yeah. And um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's say um, it took us about two months to um, um, get through like 80% of the code. Yeah, we actually st started doing this in uh, uh, April this year. Uh, but the summer was hot and we had different things to do, so we, uh, yeah, I guess uh, we did the, f uh, the, the final parts of reverse engineering right here in, in the hex center, downstairs. Right. Yeah. So. so the motivation to start in April was when we saw the talk of the University of Mannheim. They used two to the power of 16 nodes to disturb the botnet. We take we said, okay, we can overtake the whole botnet with just one node. This was our motivation. This was, I mean, I think it was last year on this Congress, and, and in April we saw the talk, and then we said, well, hmm, maybe we can do better. Yeah, but it's definitely orders of magnitude uh, is definitely uh, more weeks than months, and definitely not years. So it's it's not it's not that hard, but it's uh, you have to dig deep. So. Could you, could you maybe upload to Christmas calendar as well, just for researching and debug debugging it? <laughs> 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 K 
Can oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, samples are available from, from uh, what is it called? Uh, that one site, you know. <laughs> um, um, There's some site, just Google for it. There's a site that has a lot of malware binaries if you just register, which is kind of unethical if you ask me, but you can get it from there. Thank you. Yeah, we unfortunately lost a, a wiki in the meantime. We, <laughs> we document, documented all our stuff in, in a wiki and put PCATs there and samples and e, uh, IDA files, but we lost it. Otherwise, we would provide it to you, but yeah. Now you get the code. Other questions? <laughs> no more questions? Okay. <laughs>